you so much for this day. Thank you so much for the honor to allow us to get together and just honor you and lift your name up. And Lord, we just pray that, um, that you're pleased, that you're glorified, that you would just lead this service and we just give it unto you. Every moment, every thought, every motivation that it would be dedicated to you and led by you. We love you, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
your blood, oh, or take my body and make us one. Oh, your cross, your blood, your scars, they are not an offense to me. Ooh, your cross, your scars, your blood are not an offense to me. Ooh, your cross, your scars, your blood, they are not an offense to me.
holiness to God. Holy, holy Lord, you are holy. Lord, you are holy. Lord, you are holy. Holy, holy Lord, you are worthy. Lord, you are worthy. Lord, you are worthy. Worthy, worthy. Lord, you are worthy. Lord, you are worthy. Lord, you are worthy. Worthy, worthy. Lord, you are faithful. Lord, you are faithful.
to that manifest your presence in a greater measure, Lord. Let your glory come. Be magnified today. Be magnified today, Lord. Let your kingdom come. Your will be done in this place as it is in heaven, Lord. guys can be seated. Give it up for the amazing worship team. Ruben on the bass, okay. Me and Jason were talking, I was like, I think his shoes match his guitar. <laughs> I don't know if you meant to do that or not, but that's pretty cool. Well, good morning, everybody. I have the uh, privilege of doing the announcements today. Uh, just one of the first announcements I want to announce is uh, the Ascend Academy. Um, our fall trimester is coming up in September. Um, if you don't anything, know anything about the school, um, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm a little biased, but uh, me and my wife are completing our third year, um, literally this trimester, and we'll be done with it. And it's just, it's life-changing. It truly is life-changing. Um, just to see where it's gone, really, in the, the first, you know, the, the three years we've been doing it from the beginning, uh, before the building was here, before uh, this new building, the community of people, um, the fellowship, uh, the families, uh, just really going deep in the word, the presence of the Lord. Uh, it's been just, it's been life-changing. Um, the teachings that are coming, just being washed under the water of the word that Brian talks about a lot. Um, I would really high, highly recommend it. It's, it's per trimester, so you can give it a shot if you're feeling tugged in any sort of way and, and pray about that. Um, it's really blessed uh, me and my family, even my children. Um, the second announcement is a school of the renewing of the mind that's coming up. Woo! Yes, Lord. Um, I actually started doing these schools back in uh, 2017. And they have been just a tremendous blessing. Um, when I first started uh, hearing of Brian and, and some different meetings, I had no idea the teachings that come from these online classes. Uh, the, the revelation uh, that comes from the word um, is it's mind-boggling. Um, just a quick testimony. I, I was doing one of the, the, 
the classes. I can't remember what school it was, but he does different things from like uh, dream interpretations. We take communion together. Um, he's obviously led by the Lord and what he prays. And one night he had prayed if anybody needed healing in their bodies to lay hands on their body, and he prayed. And I actually had sprained my ankle. I was uh, cutting a Christmas tree down with my family, and I had sprained my ankle through one of the little stumps that you pull the trees out of. And uh, it was pretty bad. I was limping through work that day, and uh, he had talked about this that night, and I did it. I, I just laid my hand on my ankle, and I prayed, as, as he said. And the next morning, I woke up, and it was completely healed. And yeah, amen. Thank you, Jesus. So it's just things like that. You know, you plug into these, uh, these schools, and uh, I'm really excited about this one. The renewing of the mind, it's so key in this hour, just going deep into the Word, having your mind renewed by the Word and who God says you are and what the Word says. So I highly recommend any of the schools. Um, if you're an Ascend Academy student, you don't have to register for that. You're already grandfathered in as being a student. And that's also another blessing of even being a student in the school is you get these, uh, these online classes for free as well, which is just a blessing. Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to give now. If you guys want to bring the baskets up, you can give by way of uh, text to give. Um, the QR card that you see, um, you can make checks to Ascend Church as well if you're making checks. Um, there's offering envelopes on your chair um, if you want to fill those out. And uh, we'll, you can drop those off in the front baskets here as we play a quick video. Um, I wanted to share just something real quick from my heart out of Luke uh, chapter 6, verse 38. You can turn there if you want. This really blessed me. So Luke chapter 6, verse 38 says, Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour out into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. And as I was reading that, um, I just really felt specifically in my own life um, how the Lord has grown me in the way of giving. As you grow in the Lord and you're walking with the Lord, um, God is a generous God. And this last part here where it says, for your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. And sometimes I feel like it's just a perspective as even this teaching, the renewing of the mind. When you guys are feeling led to sow and be generous as God was generous, I look at John 3.16 it said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We serve a father who was so generous that he gave his only son to us. And sometimes we feel a little restriction in giving our own money, which is his anyway, into his kingdom. So I just encourage you as, as you give today, you're not just giving to this church or, or necessarily to a pastor, you're giving to the kingdom. And we know that Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was referring to himself. When you're giving, you're giving straight to the Lord. And he is the kingdom. And when you're giving to the kingdom, it is pressed down, it is shaken, and it will pour forth in your life. When you think about uh, God giving his son and how much we in turn receive for that eternal life as one amazing gift of his son, it is poured out into our life eternally. So anytime you are sowing into the kingdom of heaven, there is an internal seed that you are placing. And I just highly recommend, uh, this is very good soil. Me and my wife have generously tithed and offered, and just the amount of blessings, the fruit of this place and our family and our children, uh, I highly recommend um, if the Lord is, is leading you to sow into this church in any way you can, because again, you're, you're sowing into the kingdom of heaven. So I'm just going to pray. Father, thank you so much that you love us, Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Lord. Father, thank you that you are a generous father, Lord, and that anything that we sow into your kingdom, Lord, you will press down, you will shake it to pour over into our lap an, o into our lap, an overabundance of your love, Lord. Jesus, we love you. We give you all the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name. We're going to uh, play a short clip. If you want to come to the front baskets and give as you're led, and we'll be right back with you. So it's, we're somewhere well over 400 students, a lot in person and across the world online. And it's just awesome to what the Lord's doing in this hour. 
It's like drinking out of, out of a fire hose each week. Depth in the word. And I mean the fear of the Lord, like we're not bringing very um, happy stuff, you know, always. But the fear of the Lord, you know, disciples taking up your cross and, and things like this, it's, it's powerful. Jesus, isn't that good? Cranking out the, uh, okay, who is that? Let's see who the prophetic call is going to. I'm teasing. Uh, we got to see Porter with short hair and long hair in there. I don't know if you caught that. That was, that was perfect, man. Uh, before and after. Man, so good, Chris. So how about the worship? Man, come on. I was feeling like Braveheart over there for a second with like the, the, the blue uh, face paint and all that. So good. But um, man, I want to pray and really expect it um, for this morning. Uh, but before we get started, I, also I just don't want to forget, there was a couple of things I, I saw. Um, one was, uh, I think like right over here in this section, or like it could be just to the right is all I know. I saw a white window, you all on the prophetic will will get it, but open, and white's typically pure and holy. And usually when I see things to the right, it's correct or right. And so windows are normally opportunities that open to step through. So I don't know if there's someone over here, like a, a new opportunity just opened and you're praying about is it right or not uh, to step through it. If somebody could raise their hand, if that makes sense to somebody. Okay, the whole section. <laughs> no, I'm just, but no, that's amazing. We can extend our hands because it really is, I feel like, a confirmation sometimes you may have already stepped through it and just needed a confirming word, but sometimes I feel like the Lord's saying it's right. It's a pure opportunity that's new, and it just opened up, and he's wanting you to step through it, and sometimes you just need the, the prophetic confirms and stuff like that. So just extend your hands. God, thank you for each and every one that this um, landed with. We say, be glorified um, in their life. So be it, Lord. Thank you for opening windows of opportunity for destiny. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Everybody's like, I'm sitting over there next week. <laughs> I think I've told some of you this before. I was preaching in um, Arizona years ago, and sometimes the supernatural joy of God will break out. You know, we love that. We just love all of who God is. You know, Psalm 1611 says, in the presence of God, actually at his right hand is the fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore. Galatians 5 says, the fruit of the Spirit is joy, love, joy, peace. So anyway, sometimes the Holy Spirit will sneak in meetings and people get hit what, with what's called supernatural joy. Some people call it being intoxicated in the Spirit. You know, in Acts chapter 2, Peter stood up for the great Joel 2 prophecy disclaimer, and he's like, we're not drunk as you suppose. I mean, they're filled with the Spirit. And so, but it's never happened before or since like this. I was preaching in Arizona, and I think the Lord was playing a trick on me. Because the way this meeting was set up was there was an aisle up the middle and there's two big square sections right and left and um the the joy hit the whole left section but nobody over here was getting hit with the spirit i'm right in the middle of preaching i mean right tr trying to bring this profound profound sermon i thought i had and the lord's like no not really <laughs> i'm teasing but so joy hits this section and and what's funny is if you've been in these meetings a lot of our people have, have experienced this often. The Lord will sneak in and we love it. But you can be like, turn with me to Acts chapter two and everything's like hilarious. It's just joy. You're not saying anything funny. 
So I'm stuck, because normally it's sporadic, so it, I can work with it. It's like a, you know, a wave you can surf, but this is like half the meeting is gone. They don't hear anything I'm saying. Everybody over here is like locked in, like, okay, finish your next point. You know what I'm saying? So I'm kind of I'm trying to, and so it's so funny. We're trying to host the presence, but they're wanting me to preach it, and you could feel it. So all of a sudden, this elderly man, it was precious, he gets up and walks over and sits into the joy section. <laughs> it was perfect. He said, forget this religious section. I'm going over to the joy. It was too perfect. He went and squeezed himself up in there and sat right in the middle of So that was good. Um, but another one, a dream actually, I was awakened out of this morning, and it, it makes sense now, um, Shireen. It, uh, so I won't go into all of the details, but right in the middle of it was John Thurlow, who wrote um, the song, um, Storm All Around You. Yeah, that's when I felt like Braveheart. Look. Uh, and and you, y all, you all knew, because we were able to chat. So Thursdays, a lot of times, our worship team will rehearse up here. And I'm normally juggling Zoom calls with our third year, and so we're all up here. And I was able to pop in quick and see them, and they said, look, when we hit Storm All Around You, you could feel it. And so what I totally forgot, remember, I forgot. John Thurlow wrote that song. So in this dream, just, um, I, I know it's the word of the Lord for somebody. Um, because, uh, the, I'll just give you the interpretation. But the puzzle piece I couldn't, I couldn't put together was John Thurlow. I, didn't, I was like, why was he right smack in the middle of it? I'm seeing through the entire scene where it was going and why. And then right about midway, John Thurlow just walks right past me. And I was like, but now it makes sense because it's a timing thing. This is what the Lord will do often. And we, we just crossed a John Thurlow song, this service, I totally forgot. So just know um, from this morning, the word of the Lord to some of you is I could see clearly somebody, I think you meant well, this, this happens, I've done this plenty. But you, you either made a, a mistake in, in trying to hear the Lord and started going in the wrong direction. And... And it started getting, it's almost like a slippery slope. It, it just kept going wrong. To, you know, sometimes you take a wrong turn and you try to overcorrect and end up in the other ditch. And it, it starts doing this. This is what the dream was doing. And when it hit John Thurlow, which was funny, he was in all red, white shoes, which is purity and the love of God. I feel like the love of God is just trying to tell you, hey, stop, get back to where I called you. Similar to Jonah. Remember, he kept running and he just kept getting worse. And, uh, but I could see even past, John, if you, from this morning, just know by the word of the Lord, that God speaks through dreams like this often, it's really helpful. If you continue on, it's gonna, how are you doing? I feel like I ain't seen you forever, Latoya. But it, it, it's gonna continue to um, digress and diminish and get, get harder. And it really, at the end, um, so in the name of the Lord, if you need prayer at the end, we'd love to pray with you. But you know, it's like, oh, let me stop in my tracks. Because I don't know if you've ever done that before. You just get going and busy and you, and you realize that didn't work. And so you overcorrect and you just, before you know it, you're way down the path. And the Lord's trying to say, hey, no, way back where I called you, you left that spot. And sometimes we leave the spot God has us in and trying to obey what's next. And it's, it's not always ideal. So, um, so, so good of God. Isn't that awesome? He's, he really loves you and cares for you. And, and um, when you hit that song, I said, oh, wow. He's, he's playing off of it, and it's a timing thing um, this morning. So it's so good. I want to encourage you. Um, let him bring you, bring you back to that sweet spot, and, it, and he can work again from there. So let's pray. I'm really excited to have a, a word of the Lord for you. won't keep you long. And then at the end, I think we have communion ready. Uh, yeah, so William's going to lead us in communion, and look, it's going to be dangerous. You ever heard of dangerous communion? I made it up and I'm teasing, but, but no, in a good way, I want to raise your expectation. Um, if you need healing in your body, you know, the Bible's super clear that communion's a real time window where we can encounter God. It's far beyond just a wafer and some, some grape juice. It's a literal encounter where you can have a run in with God. We literally, the last communion service I was just in, a word of knowledge came forth on, on breast cancer. And during the communion service, um, I think Chris is telling me this person had a doctor's uh, appointment already set up, just so I happened to have it set up. And a word of the knowledge came forth about somebody with breast cancer. Communion, totally healed. They go to the doctor, it disappeared, gone. Yeah, the blood of Jesus. And 
So I want to encourage you, um, and also we'll give you a chance just to realign your life. You know, you want to go all in for God in this hour. This is an hour to have a foot in the world, foot in God, trying to see what you can cake and eat it to. This is all in. This is finals. This ain't even playoffs anymore. This is the end. The Lord's coming back, and you want you and your children just laying it all down for the Lord. And so um, we'll pray, take communion. It will be powerful. And that'll be good. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for um, your house, your presence. There is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. You say, have your way. Thank you, Lord. Kiss your word. Go forth, Holy Spirit. Touch the hearts and minds of your people. Most of all, be lifted up and glorified. We love you. We need you now more than ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Well, um, I don't think you'll have to turn to a whole lot of uh, verses this morning, although I'll be quoting out of a lot, enough. And I have a prop, good visual. I love these, as, as many of you know. We'll whip it out in a second, but I um, haven't been able to use one in a, in a minute. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is from the Old Testament lens um, through a New Testament filter, if you will, because we are all in the obvious New Covenant. Jesus paid it all. But how the Ark of God, how many of you know the Ark of God from the Old Testament is a depiction of Jesus Christ? And, and oh yeah, this prop we're going to keep, if that's okay, because we could use it. I was telling the guys we could use it so many different ways, and we probably will. Um, it's an actual replica of the, the Ark, so it's so cool. And um, smaller version. You can imagine us all like coming out here, <laughs> Tommy, hold your, hold your weight, bro. I got the front left corner, you know, um, but I, I told them if they want to use it, like, cause there's so many deep, so much beauty in it because it's Jesus, the ark. You can literally just hang out on the poles and why he says never remove them. I mean, it's just so good. But, um, what I really want to hit this morning is the aspects of the ark, also known as the Lord. In three different houses, you can see throughout Scripture and the outcome of all three. And to me, it's so helpful, so beautiful to see this because to me, it's a real eye-opener. Um, I think sometimes we think the issue is elsewhere, but how many of you know God never changes? The ark, his presence, his nature, his word, his authority, it never changes. It's perfect and true. But you can see crystal clear in the Word of God, depending on what house it's placed in, the outcome's vastly different from house to house to house. And um, so, yeah, you guys want to bring it out? We we'll might do a drum roll. I'm teasing. Uh, and how I see it is because I just want to move it, you know, and what will picture each house and talk to you from my heart out of. You don't need to turn there. But it, the passage, if you want to study it later, is 1 Samuel 5. Um, 1 Samuel 7 and 2 Samuel 6. It's all, um, yeah, may, maybe a, a chair here and then maybe here, Chris, if you don't mind. Well, maybe we'll make the pulpit like the third and final. Thank you so much. So appreciate it, fellas. Um, but look at this beauty. It's, it's for real. Hey, Jackson, come check it out, bro. Can you, can you see it? Is your lens not a close one? So in here, you can... You know, in the Old Covenant was the um, Ten Commandments, the two stones that Moses got on the mountain, uh, manna, rod of Aaron, things like this. It's the uh, picture of the Lord. There's so much you could go into in the teaching. But I want to hit first this first house, right? And we'll explain. This will be 1 Samuel 5, 1 Samuel 7, 2 Samuel 6. And a quick like synopsis on it is you can see the ark move to these three different houses in the Old Testament in a vastly different outcome. You would think, well, if it's the presence of God, his word, he's sovereign, outcome's the same. And I think this is a great misconception often as believers. We don't realize it's how our house is according to it is what matters. And so this first one, what it is, it's when the Philistines... Um, took the ark. This is going to be the Philistines for Samuel 5. Uh, Abinadab, and you can study it out on your own time. I'm just going to give you like a summary of them all. But then the ark moves to the house of Abinadab. And then many of us know, and this is where I'm, I'm proposing we all go to, this final and third one. 
2 Samuel um, 6, the house of Obed-Edom. Everybody knows his house. It's a couple little quick verses, and it says it blessed all of his household, everything he touched. But it's very funny when the house and the ark was in these other two houses, things changed. They, they were, it was different. It was very different. We think often just because the ark's there, everything's supposed to show up like Obed-Edom and the outcome's going to be blessed. It doesn't work that way. I love this about the Lord. He's true. He's perfect love. He, lo, love, 1 Corinthians 13 says, it rejoices with all truth. So when the Lord comes into a situation, he assesses it and uh, for, for what it is and relates to it in that manner. And I pray, especially since it's been paid in full in the New Testament, that all of us, I'm really praying this, at least it would start, we'd start together. Everybody, you know, under the sound of my voice, that we'd be ever heading towards the household of Obed-Edom. Because then you place the ark in that house and it's undeniable what happens. And I think often we're, a lot of our life, even as believers, we're in these other two categories and we wonder why the outcome's not like Obed-Edom's. And we want to start blame shifting and pointing fingers and it's, it's really the house that the ark's in. So, um, so I love this first one. It says in um, 1 Samuel 5, when the Ark of the Covenant, which was the, where the presence of God dwelt amongst the children of Israel, right? The now new covenant, we have the Ark within us, Jesus Christ. This is crazy. The Bible says the voice of God would, oh, first off, the real one, about 50 inches um, long, 30 inches wide, 30 inches high. Casey Wood covered in gold, so this is like a miniature version, but we'd say, you know, boom, still stout. But it, the Bible literally says the voice of God would speak from in between the wings of the cherubim to Moses. I can't imagine what that sounded like. Face to face as a friend, and boom, his voice is coming right between what's called the mercy seat. And it was our literal lid, because the Ten Commandments, the manna, it's, it's Jesus. So this ark was precious. They carried it everywhere they went. It was, it was God in the earth before Jesus came. So under Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, they were, Eli just, um, the Bible says, the visions were rare in those days. They weren't upright. He, he allowed his sons to slip off in things. We gotta raise our kids in the Lord. If they like it or not, listen, man, I'm probably a little stern <laughs> more than some, but I'll tell them, look, we got many doors in the house, pick one. <laughs> we serve God. Me and my house, we serve the Lord. Don't allow no Hophni and Phineas to slip and get, no. You serve God. Well, you're kind of getting legal. If you, if you clamp them too tight, they're gonna run when they get older. No, raise them in the ways of the Lord. When they get older, they'll stay according to it. Not, not religion, true love, but the fear of God and his loving kindness, the, the balance, you know, so beautiful. And when they take, I'm getting off on like a parent, parental teaching, but we need this next generation burning with the fire of God, pure, set apart ones, man, that just, aren't even attracted to the things of the world because they know the ark so well. They hear his voice and they look at the dog food of the world and they, they've been having flaming yaw from the voice of heaven. They're not attracted. So anyway, Hophni and Phinehas, are, they're living um, you know, in sin, things like this. And so they're out at battle and they lose rightfully so because they're not living right, upright with God. So the Bible says that the Philistines captured the ark right? Many of us will remember that. They brought God into their house, the Bible says, of Dagon, which was kind of their holy of holies in a sense. As their God was there. His name was Dagon. Let's just say, because this is going to go over to Benadab's house. Let's say Dagon's right here. It was basically their idol, their God set up that they worshiped. They thought that's their holy relic. Let's put it right next to Dagon. Bad move. So I can just imagine the humorous side to me. You post God up next to Dagon. I said, Dagon, long time no see, my friend. You know what I mean? He's like, actually, I see everything, but you didn't see me in a minute. How you been? Love what you've done with the place. I mean, Dagon's trembling. It's obviously an idle figure, but the demons that swirl around their source of power. He's like, remember when... Uh, you fell for the whole, you got duped. Remember with Lucifer, he thought he was something. You and you boys, y'all formed your little crew. That was nice, wasn't it? Yeah, that was real good. Kind of dim in here, Dagon, a little dark. Anyway, good talk. I can just imagine, Dagon's like, what? Are they, they put God next to me. <laughs> he 
close God up next to Dagon, man. He's like, I created you. I don't know what y'all were thinking anyway. So all of a sudden the Bible says Dagon, this idol falls face first before him. Their idol, all of it bows. N nothing cannot bow to God. That's why I love true biblical warfare, man. The, the, the enemy gets way too much credit, way too much credit. Everything in all of creation bows to God, and so should we. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. So Dagon face first, and they come in the next morning. God's like, hey, I didn't tell him to. It's just, it's nature. Everything bows to me. I created it all. It's the perfect way. And they go, huh, maybe a gust of wind came through that one window. I don't know. They prop Dagon back up. God's like, hey, how, how was the face first thing for you? <laughs> I'm teasing. But uh, Dagon's trembling again. The Bible says second morning they go in early. I do like this, though. The Bible says if you read close, they went in er very early. Even the dark side sometimes is more diligent about their idols than we are. We've got to seek God. So, uh, uh, but anyway, so it says day two, Dagon falls face first again before God, but now his head and his hands, so specific. If something was brittle and just fell and cracked in random pieces, that's fine, but this was strategic. It says the hands of the idol and the head came off. So now just his torso is before God and the Bible says that his actual head and hands fell and were laying on the threshold. That's a wonder, full out. It says ever since then, the Philistines, they'd always step over the threshold because they felt it was holy because Dagon had landed on it. When God's saying, hey, it's a new day. The threshold speaks of a new crossing over. I'm trying to tell you all. I'm really teaching my people something, but since you posted me up here, I'm trying to let you know your God's inferior. And it, if it's ever around anything that has to do with me, I remove its wisdom and its ability. God always, I love that. He, our own wisdom and our ability, not by your might and strength, he'll just decapitate it and put it on a threshold to tell you, look, if you want to really cross over and step into new things, worship me. Um, but this first state, to look at it through the believer lens, uh, believer's life and lens, is often the ark of God. And this is what I, I hope we're ever going towards this. But often there's Philistine tendencies still within us. So the Philistines represent everything opposite God's will and word. Things in our life that we're still doing that are blatantly against his word and will. It could be blatant sin for sure. Lust, pornography, um, adultery, go gossip, lying is a full out Philistine way. Um, complaining, sin, and, and so many more. But when we have these Philistine ways in our life, the ark of God does that. It starts to fold Dagon's. There ain't no blessing in the house of Dagon. Nothing, the ark doesn't do that there. And see where we start getting confused as we think, man, the ark of God's in my house. What? I read in Obed-Edom's house. He goes, yeah, but you got Dagon's in your life. We're not even there yet. We're not even too blessing yet. Everybody wants blessing from God, but we want to hang on to Dagon's. And the ark, what God does, he comes in and he, he decapitates Dagon's. And see, this is what happens in houses like, like this. Uh, and please don't take this the wrong way. We just really love the Lord though, and his word and we fear God and we want to go deeper into it. But when the ark of God is really in a house, people come in with Dagon's and you start getting put in a corner. You, start get, you have a choice. And people want their Dagon's. They want them propped up again the second day and they realize it keeps falling down. Often what they do is just like the Philistines did, they, they get away from the ark so they can hang on to their Dagon's. Meaning this first house it's in, he's gonna start forcing you into a choice. How many of you, when you first got born again, it was not all roses. It was like conviction, repentance, like, yeah. And in his loving kindness, but he, I remember just like, he, he starts coming against those Dagon's for your own good early on. And so this first house, that's what he does. And again, that's why so many people, they eat, what Philistines end up having to do was, they said, hey, hold on, this isn't good. We, we like our ways. We like our idols. And just so you know, um, modern day idols, people think, oh, we don't have those anymore. An idol is anything that captivates your thought and attention more than God. It can be your child. <gasps> no, I really mean an idol is anything you worship, which it captivates more of your attention, your thought life than God. He says, I'll have no one else before me. 
there are for sure modern day idols. It looks like so many different things. People worship sports teams so much more than God. You could go on and on down the list, but those are Dagon's. And you bring the true ark of God. We always say we want the, you know, your kingdom come. We want your presence come. And so when he comes, immediately, if there's any Philistine tendencies, he's going to check them. They're going to start, they're going to start getting exposed, which is a great thing, especially in a house like this, because we get it. We're like, please do it, Lord. And then we were gracious and merciful with each other. But you either have two choices, either hang on to your Dagons and send the ark away or get away from it or welcome the ark and let the Dagons fall. You guys understand that first house? So it's, it's very different from Obed-Edom's house. This is like a progression. And um, we could sit here forever, but I, I love this first one. And then you move to the house of Abinadab. It's a little better, but still not even close to Obed-Edom. And um, in 1 Samuel 7, it says this, that the, from this point, yeah, so first off, the ark opposes Dagon. They said, get this thing out of here. They move it to a next city up. A plague of tumors hits the place. Next city up, they're like, this thing is a bad, you know, whatever, it, you know. But it's, it's the glorious presence of God. He's perfect and true. But people don't know this about the Lord. He will come against anything that opposes him. Even in the new covenant. No, he's, he's all mercy and love in the new covenant, really. Peter says, you lied to the Holy Ghost to Ananias the fire. That's Dagon type stuff. When the real fear of the Lord and presence of God comes in, that stuff doesn't fly. Dagon start hitting the deck. Is it getting too heavy or is it good? Okay, well, it's getting really good. Just hang on for the laugh out. <laughs> but I love this. You don't want some false gods. You know what I mean? You want them. And that's the beauty of this house. It looks vastly different from um, Obed-Edom's. It, it checks everything that's not of God. But it says they sent it to a next city. They got hit with a plague of tumors. They said, get this thing out of here. Next city, plague of rats came against them. So they sent it back and then it ended up under Saul's watch. And the Bible says that Saul took the ark of God and put it in the house of Abinadab, right? Again, you'd think the presence of the Lord, the manna, the 10 commandments, he speaks from this place. This is God. Wherever it goes, it's abound to multiply and bless and be fruitful. It definitely does not. It depends on what house it's in. So what I'm encouraging us is individually and corporately, we, we ever be going towards the house of Obed-Edom, which I'll unpack here in a second, because I think we, we miss, there's a misconception on not knowing what God's doing in our lives. And often we reverse this thinking he's going to bless us. And we're like, whoa, what's happening here? What's happening here? And he's, he's relating to the house with what it needs to be done in that house. And so anyway, it says Saul um, brought the ark to the house of Abinadab and it stayed in his house 20 years. And that's all it says. You know why? The ark went dormant. Nobody knows the side of God. You, again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Obed-Edom, three months, 90 days, everything blessed. It's not a timing issue with God. He can blow up blessing and that's his heart always. His heart is Obed-Edom. And that's where we're going. I see, I've seen it for years. I remember, I can think back now that I, with knowing what I know now, in Bible college, in a bona fide outpouring of the spirit, and on one row, you'd have three different houses. It'd be one person like Obed blessed in the presence of God. Abinadab, not yielding uprightly, dormant, crickets. Another house, God's checking everything in me. He's, everything's folding and they're all in the same row. The ark of God isn't the issue, it's us. And so God's so good and he's ever, if we'll just yield and follow and look, sometimes you'll get this, this far and you'll take steps, steps back and that's okay, he loves you, just keep going this way. And I wanna pray at the end that we'd really be, you know, again, a household like that of Obed. But it says Saul brought the ark to Abinadab's house, it was on a hill. I imagine it was an incredible estate. I mean, he had the you know, primo acreage on the hill, overlooked everything. This is, so you would have thought if there was any house that would represent God and he'd want to bless, it'd be Abinadab's because Obed-Edom's, it was just a shack off to the side. 
Literally, it was the closest one David found when the fear of the Lord hit. Uzzah died. He said, let me just go off the side road and dump it in Uzzah's house. And so Abinadab's got the sweet spot on the hill. He puts it there to protect it 20 years. And that's all the Bible says about the ark for 20 years. It went dormant, sat there and collected dust. And this is why this, I would say, is probably the most common category in the life of believers at large, the church at large. Abinadab was under the, the order of Saul. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians uh, Chronicles sorry, 13, that in the days of Saul, they didn't seek or inquire before the ark, meaning first love and truly honoring God and, and trying to hear his voice was not a priority. They literally only look, used it like a good luck charm to bring out and do for them what they needed. So what this picture is, is the life of a self-absorbed Christian. You're in God, you're a believer, you're going to make it to heaven, but you're still all about you. Try that shoe on with God. It doesn't fit. As soon as you become self-absorbed, or if you're even in that state, the ark goes dormant. And this is the, the window and the stage. Many I've been in it plenty. That's how I normally tell. Like, whoa, go to your prayer closet one time and just talk all about you and, and see how far you get. You know, I was thinking of, of like a fun analogy with, you know, we're, we're figuratively the bride. Jesus is the bridegroom. And so you go out on a date, you know, with the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're across the table, and you're just talking all about you, what you need, and, and this, that, and the other, and me, and my call. And, and, and I'm in this season because where am I going next? And me and I, and what about me? And he's going to be sitting there just staring at you. You're eating your spaghetti, getting it all over your, the stains of self-absorption, all this tomato sauce. <laughs> he just picks up a piece of garlic bread and chewing it, staring at you. He's like, oh, Benadab's house. I, I know that stage real well. My ark sits in those houses for like 22 decades, and I don't, I don't do anything with that. When you're ready to get over you, we'll talk Obed. But as long as you want to be self-absorbed, the ark does nothing. It's the ark, though. The Ten Commandments are the manna. We think it's some like genie lamp you can rub and it's magical. No, God relates according to what house he's in. You want to go self-absorption and care all about you. And this is, this speaks of the people, they come to God and they won't say it, but they're coming to God truly at the end of the day when nobody's watching their deep heart cries, I'm going to God because what can he do for me? This is backwards. And this is where God will go dormant. And you think, why aren't you speaking God? Why is nothing working? And this is a lot of the times the state people are in, and then they'll go high five Obed one day. Obed's like, you should see my garden. I don't know what happened. I did the same thing last year, but David brought the ark in my house and everything is just blessed. And so, um, but I want to encourage us and pray again that, uh, so Abinadab, yeah, he was under the order of Saul. He died in the same battle Saul did. They were out fighting. And the ark literally just stayed posted up, collected dust, just like an old relic to them. And so I think it's healthy to see this in scripture that the, the same God, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, depending on what house he's in, the, the outcome's very, very different. If he's in a house of Dagon and there's still heavy Philistine tendencies, he's gonna oppose. He will be God, there will be no other beside him. And if you get offended and leave, he's fine with it until he beheads the thing. It, he, it literally gets such pressure that you've either got to yield to him or run away from him. And people think, no way, God, he's, he's going to keep chasing. And he will, but he has his, his standard and his way. He will not have Dagon's. We need to know this. This is the real gospel. He's not going to play patty cake with your sins. He's going to check them at the door. And he's going to love you and forgive you and remove your sins as far as the east is from the west. He, he's that good, but you need to know he, he decapitates Dagon's. You move to this house, you finally at least get out of the blatant sins, and, but you're still about you. This is why Jesus checks that early on of those who want to follow him. And then he'll just go, oh, I'll just, I'll wait as long as you like, but whenever you're over you, then we can talk. Are you guys seeing that? It's so beautiful. And when we get over us, this is Obed, the ark comes alive. Because this is who he dwells with, we'll move it. You shift because then it went from Abinadab's house. David knew. Because see, under the order of Saul, even Saul, that's why God was so excited to finally find David. He says, finally, a man after my own heart. David was still, Saul was still about his heart. 
And I'll stay connected with God because what about me and my fame and what can you do for me? And again, you can ride that train as long as you'd like, but you may find that 20 years later, God's still with you, you're still saved, but there's just dust collecting on the ark. And this is where we normally get into blame shifting and we start hopping to the next conference or need another prophetic word, I need another excitement or emotional spike or high. He don't care. He'll sit there until you are exposed, capital Y-O-U, because it's all about you. He'll expose you, I'm saying it's beautiful. He's, so, he's good like this, he's not trying to make you pay, he's just not going to do it any other way. So you move to Obed's house, David realized, he goes, oh my gosh, the, the presence of God, our central, our reason for living. This is the presence and word of God, we've gotta get him back, you know, into our territory so he knows to capture the ark, you know, from, it was in Abinadab's house all that time. We all remember, I touched on it with the fear of the Lord some time ago, that Uzzah was merely a driver of the cart. Wasn't a Levite, not a true worshiper of God. They hit a bump in the road. He touches it irreverently, dies. So David says, whoa, this is a little, touch, a little more touchy than I thought. Just finds the nearest house. It happens to be Obed-Edom. Um, which his name, Obed, and I love this. My mind just starts working. I love that Obed is the first, just about half of the word obedience. Obed, obed <laughs> yeah, or whatever. Um, but but the, the name Obed means servant and worshiper. And he was a Levite. Best house to put the ark in. Servant. Servants don't think about them. They're not self-absorbed. They do not care. So they put the ark in the house. He goes, look, family, look at this. I promise you, I promise you that uh, uh, sorry, that the, the ark was the, the central hinge that his whole life swung on. He, he, they cleared out all furniture, put it dead center. Family, the, I don't know how long it's gonna be here, but he's the reason we live. We move, we have our being. Polished it daily, reverence, worship, served, ministered to the Lord. Everything was around the presence. In, in this life right here, the ark's like, finally, it comes alive, blesses everything you touch. And so th this is the difference. I've seen it for years. We've been in ministry. I see it all the time. I'll talk to a Abinadab, Dormant. I don't know. I just can't. Thank you so much. You know, I'll talk to Abinadab and they're still very caught up on them. And God's so gracious. Oh my gosh. Um, all of us have so far to go. I still am having to check all of, all of these phases. So they're, that's beautiful if we're just being really real with ourselves. You could be 20 years in the Lord and he's like, hey, yeah, you didn't see this Dagon, this little one that's been there for all that. He's so good, but he'll still check it and want to remove it, right? Then we'll see areas of our heart as we go deeper in him. He's like, hey, you're still really about you here. I need that to move because I, I, everywhere you're about you, I go dormant. It doesn't work. I don't come alive there. I come alive with first love, laid down lovers. They, they don't care about them and they love me above all, truly. It's not just words. And so I'll see it all the time, same row. You can have the people where it's like, I just don't know. Cause I, you know, what about me? And they're not thinking about serving at all. Thinking about what's gonna serve them and God. And that's why I come to seek God. Cause I, I gotta have an encounter because I, and it's all about you. If you have one, praise God, but it's never, it's never about that, it's about him. And these are the old beds. And this is why when they get in his house, it takes 90 days and everything flips upside down. I can imagine old bed, you know, he goes in the kitchen. He's like, Sue Ann, I don't know his wife's name. Since he's, he's, since he's a double name. Sue Ann, what, what kind of bread is this? What? And she's yelling from the other part of the house. Obed, same one I always get. That's, that's that great value, you know, Walmart. He's like, you better come look. This thing's twice the size. We don't have deli meat to fit on that. Everything. It says his entire household just blessed. And they're like, we can't even eat all that. It's too much but then it doesn't go stale, doesn't mold. Clothes are always perfect. He goes to the ATM. He's like, I did not know I had all that in the account. 
Blessed, blessed is blessed. He's like, man, I had that little ball spot and it grew back. I'm teasing, like whatever, <laughs> whatever. Like every area of his life, it says his entire household was blessed, but it's the same ark, same God. Nothing changes with God. I'm telling you that your biggest enemy in life is you. It's not the devil, never was, never was. We spend so much time binding and rebuking the Lord, like, would you just die already? <laughs> I really, his heart is this household right here. Three months, everything. And I'm telling you, I've been around these people. And I'm, I'm trying to go further to it. It doesn't matter. You put anything in their hand, they touch anything, they, anything connected to their house. And so I'm praying it continues to not only um, us being a household corporately, uh, and just so you know, I've, I literally hear it a lot. Praise God. People are like, I don't know what happened. I started sowing into the ministry. And we did offering already, so I'm not trying to pull somebody's arm. And it's ever since, bam, my work. And I don't know how. And, and this is what we want corporately, but individually. We go home, I don't know why. My kids love God. All I did was make sure I served him and worshiped and I ministered to him. And it was never about me. And what I love too, later, David figures it out. Word gets back to David. He says, man, the Obed's place flipped upside down. He's probably thinking, what happened? 20 years at Abinadab's house, nothing. Dust. Same ark. I'm telling you, often, and, and this is encouraging because this often reveals what stage you're in. If, you're, if, you're, if, the, if you come into our house and seek God with us and you feel a lot of resistance and pressure, praise God. Let the Dagons get revealed and be beheaded. And then if you come around the ark and you're like, man, Stuff just seems dry and flat and dormant. The Lord's probably sitting there with his garlic bread, chewing on it, looking at you. While you're just all about you with your spaghetti, you know what I mean? And he loves you, but he'll wait 20 years if he has to. He does not go deep with people that are all about them. One of the sure ways to have your destiny hit a screeching halt is make it about you. The Lord, you'll stop right there. You'll get to heaven, but then you move to Obed's house. He's like, finally, a selfless person. It's, it's not about them. They just love me truly, which means they obey. There's obedience. When you truly love something, you obey whatever the cost. And I love later, the Bible says, David brought the ark and Obed was a doorkeeper. He was fine. He never, he didn't care. If, it's, if I'm the center of focus, it's at my house or I'm a doorkeeper. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. Better is one day in his course. He'll just be around the ark. These type people, the Lord blesses and, and things just multiply and expound greatly in his presence. So I want to encourage you guys, and we pray before communion together, that we, in his love, but also like an eye opener, like, whoa, I didn't realize that. Like, help me, Lord. That makes sense why things have seemed a bit flat. And, and this is another thing I love, kind of connected, but a side topic is, People that are still not that deep in the Lord, they can't handle when the things settle. I've seen this so, so often. There's got to be these constant emotional highs. You know what I mean? Where's my next, like I touched on earlier, fix, or I need a prophet, I need a sign. And, and we love all these, we do these. But as soon as it settles for any length of time, this is something else the ark will do in your life. Let things settle to expose areas of your life where you don't really trust him or you still are about you or whatever it may be. But as soon as things settle, people get that aren't deep and truly that he's their all, they get restless, start making bad decisions, start jumping out, like I said, with that dream and trying to overcorrect and get way out there. Whereas people that are deep in the Lord, when things settle, they love it. They're very comfortable there. They don't need the next hype and emotional high. And although that's amazing, but they, they love it when the Lord turns to them and says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Yes, Lord, what next? They love when the Lord looks at them and says, I have no place to rest my head. Probably gonna be in the dirt all day, boys. No, no shade. You still wanna run with me? These people, they're, they bail. They need a dainty place to lay their head always. As soon as you pull the pillow out, they're gone. No thanks. Deep people, because he's really it. Obed Edoms, I promise you, Obed didn't give a rip. He got sleep in the dirt all the days of my life because the ark's here. You're everything to me. And God's like, finally, I can release all of who I am to 
to a lover that, that fully serves. And they're, they're hard to find. Um, but God can do it, thank God. So I don't want to make it sound like an impossible feat to, to step into, but he's doing it in all of our lives. And if we'll yield, he'll take us here. And then those are the people he can bless. And he does it every time. Everything they touch is, is just wild. So I um, want to encourage you guys with that. We'll pray. If you want to go ahead and stand, we'll pray. That'll be good. And we'll get ready for communion. Thank you, Jesus. But yeah, again, I want to encourage you guys because sometimes the Lord will do that on purpose to see, you know, how deep you'll run with him. He'll look at you and say, I don't, I don't have a pillow. I don't even know where I'm laying my head today. Wait, Ob Abinadab's, there's still so much in it for you and what's in it for me when you're like, hold on, I don't have a pillow. I don't know where we're going. I mean, I, I want to know what's next. I, you know, they fall off there. Obeds are like, you're my portion. If you're there, I'm good. What about a pillow? What about comfort? What about, I love the Bible also says that the end talks about a company growing and that we're, they're here now um, where there'll, there'll be lovers of self and it, you read further rather than lovers of God. They just, you love you more than God. That's an Abinadab kind of stage. That's where God just kind of goes dormant. Um, I, I love Second Corinthians. Paul, listen to Paul. Okay, these are the guys that we're, we're trying to follow after. Um, he says, in, he gives a long list of his, his life in God. He says, in perils of my own countrymen, my crew in perils, they turned on me, in perils at the deep, in perils over and over, this price he paid. You know what I mean? And we're so quick to like, it's just, I'm telling you, we got to get to this place where we're over us and God can have his, his full way through our life. And that's all he's looking for is a deep lovers that are selfless, you know, and it's so beautiful. But he goes through this entire list out at sea. You know, a lot of us would check out soon as somebody offended us. I'm getting off on another, I'll save that for another sermon. But just nowadays it's getting, you know, we, we've got to, Allow him to go deep in us so when the deep of God cries out, he finds the deep in us. Do you know what I'm saying? There's this whole thing nowadays, people are getting so easily offended or you gotta be politically correct. That, how would that work with the Lord? Anyway, I'm gonna get off my own thing. Let's pray. <laughs> Let's stay. Uh, I just really, I'm feeling the Lord pull us this way and if we'll yield, it's so freeing, so pure, so beautiful and so true. So Lord, thank you for your word and um, thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you that Jesus, you are the ark. You are the presence. And Lord, I pray, I want you to just lift your hands to heaven and receive by faith and everybody watching across the world online. I pray you'd continue to do a deep work within us, Lord. Let us move towards the, the household of Obed-Edom. That would be worshipers who truly love you above all. It's not just something we say, we really do, we really mean it. And servants, our first like knee-jerk reaction is how can we serve God? Not how can I seek God so what he, what he can do for me? Get us out of that Abinadab stage so your ark can come alive. Lord, let your ark come alive because you truly get glory when we're blessed. That's always been your plan. So I, I really speak that over each and every one under the sound of my voice that you'd be a household of Obed-Edom in the name of the Lord. Jesus, that you do a deep work within our life. Deepen us, I pray. Give us a fresh grace to walk with you like never before and make us households of Obed-Edom, both corporately and individually. Make us like Obed, Lord. Servant worshipers, yielded ones that are over us so your ark can come alive. Thank you for your ark opposing Philistine tendencies in our life. Let it have its work there. Thank you that your art goes dormant when we are too top heavy about us. Move us now unto you that you may get full glory. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. So um, if we can bring the elements, everybody can start getting those. It's gonna be a powerful time of communion. And um, you all are free to come get the elements. And then as soon as 
William comes up. Oh, you're going to bring it? Thanks, man. Thank you so much. Um, if the prayer team could join, William would be amazing. Love you guys. like to um, read a portion from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 um, verses 23 onwards. You don't have to turn there. You can just uh, focus on Jesus as I read this passage. Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread
and made him and he had given thanks he broke it jesus fully knew that he is going to get betrayed the one who was who has been walking with him jesus fully knew he was fully man but at the same time he's the son of god he knew the excruciating pain that he's going to go through on the cross what did he do he gave thanks fully knowing that he is going to get betrayed fully knowing that he is going to get crucified what did he do he gave thanks that's one resounding word that i've always been hearing in this house no matter what we can go through having the thankful attitude will break any chains that the enemy is trying to put into your life he did the same when he had to feed thousands and he had only five loaves of bread he gave thanks philippians 3 2 5 says may this attitude be in you the one that was in jesus christ he gave thanks may thankfulness be the anchor that we hold on to in our life regardless whether someone is betraying you whether you're going to a rough patch in your life whether you are lonely you feel like it enemy enemy saying all these things the rest of this passage we have so much to be thankful about Jesus did not use that opportunity to prove himself you know what i have always been right it's judas who no he did not say a thing thankfulness will change your life we have so much only one thing need focus on that one let's focus on jesus let me as we finish let me continue the rest of this passage and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the lord this is the body and the blood that we are partaking Jesus We are so thankful that you have brought us to this place to enter into that covenant relationship with you as we partake in your body and in your blood Lord we completely surrender our lives our mind our body our soul and our spirit Lord we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice as you partake in your body and blood
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your unconditional love and acceptance. I pray that as we partake in your body and blood, may the same mind that is in you, let our minds be renewed. May our attitudes change. May our mindset change. May our thinking change. And let it be all about you. So that our life is going to be a living testimony. Just as how Obed Edom did. He didn't have to say a word. It was evident in his life. In his family. In his household. In his workplace. May we be open newspapers of Jesus. Let your goodness be reflected from our life. As we partake in your blood and in your body. On this day, if there is anyone with sickness, I pray let your healing virtue flow through each body. Let there be an inside out strength like never before. Joy and peace and hope overflowing as your body and blood becomes part of our lives. Thank you, Jesus. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may partake in His body and blood. As the worship team is here, if anyone have any needs to pray for, any sickness that needs to be, I believe it is completely healed. But any, if any other prayer request or anything that you need to pray for, you can come forward.
crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live through Christ. Crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live through Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son, Father. We thank you for your word today, Lord God. Thank you for your living word in our lives, Father. Yes, Father, thank you for using our pastor today to speak your word, to speak your truth, Father. Father, your, love be, your word being a loving conviction in our lives, Father. Father, revealing to us which house are we in, Father. And seeking to be in the house of like Obed-Edom. Father, we thank you for that. Father, thank you for filling us with your love, with your grace, Father. Father, I pray that this word today just resonates in us throughout the week, Father. And we just lay it out to you at your feet every day. Father, a full surrender to you every day, revealing anything that is coming before you, revealing anything that's coming before your son. Father, let us just lay it out. Father, I pray a full surrender to you. Father, we thank you for your, your love. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen.